As we reflect and mark this solemn and important day in our country's history, we think about our freedoms as Americans, the sanctity of our democracy, a democracy you just heard President Biden say that we could lose if we don't defend it. As the last few years have illustrated, the indictments by special counsel Jack Smith and Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis exposed how the effort to overturn the 2020 presidential election was not at all some spur of the moment idea. It was a premeditated criminal conspiracy. It involved many, many people and many, many steps. Willis, who charged 18 others along with the ex president, described the efforts in Georgia as a, quote, criminal enterprise. Even though both indictments were stuffed to the gills with stories of what the ex president and his allies did to our democracy. According to our friend and voting rights attorney, Mark Elias, one more aspect of the attempted coup has gone missing. He writes this, quote, even after reading these two indictments, I realized something was still missing. Trump's audacious effort to enlist the United States Supreme Court in throwing out the election results in four key battleground states. At the time, Trump called the case, quote, the big one. If successful, this one lawsuit would have disenfranchised more than 20 million voters across Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and change the results of the election. Now, if this part is fuzzy in your memory, it was originally filed by the Attorney General of Texas, and it soon garnered the support of 17 other states and more than 100 sitting Republican members of Congress. However, the Supreme Court, even with its conservative majority, tossed out the case saying the state of Texas had no standing to bring it. Elias continues, quote, other than the events that took place on January 6, the Texas case was the most profoundly anti-democratic act in the post-election period. The use of state resources and official imprimatur to traffic in false information and overturn an election was a precursor to the fake elector schemes and Jeffrey Clark's attempt to use government resources to overturn Georgia's election results. Elias concludes that maybe the indictments did not include this Texas lawsuit because they already had enough to tell the narrative without it. But his point is one that we should not brush aside, especially with the 2024 campaign season inching closer every day. It's crucial not to forget the full scope of what they had in mind for the coup, the full scope of the anti-democratic forces that Trump sought to bring to bear to undo the will of the American people. It's where we start the hour. Voting rights attorney Mark Elias, the founder of the site Democracy Docket and author of the piece we just read from, is here with us. Also joining us, Princeton University professor and distinguished political scholar Eddie Gladys Back, and former assistant U.S. attorney and president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, Maya Wiley, is back with us. Um, Mark, it's um, a fabulous piece, perfectly argued, but also a sort of a, a note to all of us who talk about the coup even when we think we're talking about it in its entirety, this is one of the foundational pieces of it. Absolutely. You know, I realized that as we read the indictments, we get one picture of what happened. When we talk about the fact that there were 64 or 65 lawsuits that Donald Trump and his allies lost, we get sort of a different picture. But what's really at the centerpiece of this scheme was an effort to throw out the election results of four states. And that scheme used state resources. That's what made it different than the other, uh, the other lawsuits. This was a case using taxpayer resources, using the official seal, using official resources, official personnel to try to throw out the election results of four other states. And Nicole, this is really critical. This lawsuit was the first organizing effort for Donald Trump for the what happened in the Capitol on January 6th. Why do I say that? Because when you when this before this lawsuit was filed, you know, Donald Trump and his, you know, ragtag band of, of misfit lawyers were out there losing lawsuits. When this lawsuit was filed, all of a sudden Republican officials needed to put their cards on the table. And 126 Republican members of Congress 
join this lawsuit, which meant if you're Donald Trump sitting in the White House planning out what is to come on January 6th, you know you are starting with 126 members of the House. You know you're starting with 17 or 18 attorneys generals and some governors. And that really is what coalesced the official Republican Party support for what eventually became the most tragic day in American democracy. Mark, there's a piece of it that I can't get over, and I, I mention it here all the time, but, but maybe your crystallization can shed light on this. The Republicans who sign onto the law, the, the lawsuit is bogus and it's BS, but it's predicated on something Trump starts saying in the summer about the election being rigged because mail-in voting was going to be permitted in the heat of a pandemic. All of the Republic, every single Republican member of Congress who signed on to it thought the votes and the ballots were legitimate enough to believe in the sanctity of their elections. H how come they were never confronted with exactly how they thought the ballots had been corrupted just on the presidential line? Again, I think this is really, really critical because I think it goes to why this case was so important. Because it is the first time that you have Republican members of Congress from these states, even, from the states, from the four states they're trying to throw out the election from, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Georgia, you have Republican members of Congress signing on to a brief, basically saying the ballots that elected them were fraudulent. And that is a very, very important milestone to understand what happens to the Republican Party when you get into January 6th. And, and just, you know, all my viewers vote, but, you know, it's the same ballot, right? You go into the booth and the same piece of paper is the same ballot. So I, I, I want to deal with one other thing with you, Mark, and that's premeditation. I thought one of the most dramatic exhibits that the January 6th Select Committee had was an email from Tom Fitton, sort of right-wing legal agitator, that just bumped the timeline back to July of 2020, talking about in writing, in emails to the White House about when they would contest the sanctity of the vote. It's, it's not even when the polls show that he'll likely lose. It's back in July. And then here's, here's Trump in September um, talking about the urgency of filling the Supreme Court vacancy. I think this will end up in the Supreme Court. And I think it's very important that we have nine justices. I think it's better if you go before the election because I think this, this scam that the Democrats are pulling, it's a scam. The scam will be before the United States Supreme Court. And I think having a 4-4 situation is not a good situation. If you get that, I don't know that you'd get that. I think it should be 8 nothing or 9 nothing. But just in case it would be uh, more political than it should be, I think it's very important to have a uh, ninth justice. So in September, Donald Trump is planning on taking his defeat to the Supreme Court. And that is the sort of predication for confirming the Ninth Justice. Yeah, look, you know, people forget, but in 20, in December of 2016, this is after Donald Trump won the election, he was saying that there was voter fraud. He said that the entire state of California results were the result of like a million illegal ballots. He appointed a fraud, voter fraud commission in 2017 to look into it. At the time, everyone just dismissed this as kind of like a weird thing that Donald Trump was somehow looking into voter fraud in an election that had put him in office. But this has been a persistent theme of his pathology, which is he always wants to question the outcome of elections because he's never sure when he's going to need it. And he knew that having lost the popular vote in 2016, he was very sensitive about that, which is why he claim, makes these ridiculous claims in 2016 and 2017. When you get to 2020, he is questioning the balloting and questioning the voting and questioning everything about the election because he knows he is likely to lose the popular vote again and he's likely to lose overall. And he always wanted to keep optionality. What he needed after the election was a way to crystallize that into institutional support, not the support of Sidney Powell, but institutional support. And that's what this Texas case was.